This is CBC Vancouver News. It's unacceptable for these kinds of things to happen behind closed doors. This is a colossal headache anger over resident repercussions of a new wastewater treatment plant on the North Shore. It's now more than five times over budget and a decade overdue. Plus, politicians have forgotten about people. Some medical patients in the Kootenays feel forgotten, with many going to great lengths and distances for adequate health care. Also, the whale was giving a really big fight. Like before it passed away, it was moving its tail, trying to help us too. A community effort in the dozens, not enough to save a beached orca off Vancouver Island. Hello, I'm Tanya Fletcher. Thanks for joining us. Households on the North Shore will wind up spending roughly $20,000 over the next three decades, all to pay for the completion of a much-delayed wastewater treatment plant that's been mired in controversy and huge cost overruns. As Janella Hamilton reports, the price tag for the project has more than quadrupled since construction began, drawing anger around lack of transparency and accountability. Ten years after the project was first announced, the North Shore wastewater treatment plant is not even 30% complete and more than five times the projected budget. The new price tag, $3.86 billion. This is a colossal headache. The much-delayed project hit major roadblocks in 2022 when Metro Vancouver ended its contract with Axiona, the Spain-based company responsible for designing and building the plant. There were 1,500 deficiencies found. Uh, I've physically been in there and been shown the deficiencies. Mind-blowing. To finally get the job done, Metro Vancouver says the average household on the North Shore will have to pay an extra $725 every year over 30 years through increases to utility and property taxes. In the case of homeowners, well, it just keeps going up year after year after year. And incidentally, in 2024, North Vancouver District, where I live, has seen the biggest tax increases. The existing sewage plant near the Lionsgate Bridge has reached the end of its life and only provides primary treatment. Federal law now requires facilities to also remove microplastics. We need the federal and provincial governments to step up and provide more funding. Metro Vancouver and Axiona are also embroiled in a lengthy legal dispute. This expert says taxpayers will likely end up covering some of those costs too. It's unacceptable for these kinds of things to happen behind closed doors. When billions of taxpayer dollars are on the hook, taxpayers deserve accountability and transparency. I'm calling on the provincial government to have a forensic audit because we all need to know what went wrong so it doesn't happen again. They're both calling for better provincial oversight of major projects like this one that involve taxpayer dollars. Metro Vancouver says PCL construction has taken over the project, which is now set to be up and running by 2030. Janella Hamilton, CBC News, North Vancouver. To Vancouver Island now, where a beached killer whale has died despite a mass effort by the community to save it. Our Kelly McTavish has that story. Kyle Harry sang a prayer song for the orca after efforts to save it ended in tragedy. The Aharasut First Nation man and his fiancée, Florence Bruce, were among dozens of people trying to help the mammal. The whale was giving a really big fight, like before it passed away, it was moving its tail, trying to help us too, but she ended up passing away. The female orca got stranded in an inlet near Zabalos at low tide while her calf swam nearby. We died, mama died. Oh, that's, oh, there it is. But it was a very powerful moment to be so right there, touching a killer whale, trying to save it. I've like, I'm so sad inside. It's kind of like I lost a relative which because our First Nations people are so close to our land and our animals. 
On social media, the Marine Education and Research Society suggests the orca may have become stranded after coming in on a high tide to hunt, then got stuck when the water receded. Yeah, and it was hunting too, because um, and there was a dead seal around the baby, the mother, when we got there. The Marine Society says that although nothing has been confirmed, the mother could have also been facing health issues. The group goes on to say the survival of the calf will depend on its age and whether there are additional orca family members nearby. The chief of the Iharasut First Nation says tribal members have been out on the water trying to see if there is a pod in the area that could help with the calf's survival. The Federal Department of Fisheries and Oceans confirms to CBC News it is on scene investigating the orca's death. Callie McTavish, CBC News, Vancouver. Medical patients in the East Kootenai region are calling for more support from the province. Hundreds of them are forced to travel long distances for the care they need, often amounting to thousands of dollars and weeks away from home. Our Corey Bullock is hearing about the toll it's taking on two Cranbrook families in particular. For nine-year-old Sawyer Sutton and his family, traveling for treatment of his Crohn's disease is stressful. My hope is just that we can keep going the best that we can and keep managing it so that he doesn't have to struggle the way that he has. Pediatric Crohn's disease is an incurable inflammatory bowel disease. Sawyer got sick in 2021. He has since had two treatments, including surgery at BC Children's Hospital in Vancouver. It's hard to see him struggle. It's hard to see him some days have tummy problems and just wish that he was a regular kid. Sawyer's grandma, Debbie Hart, says his condition is hard on the whole family. While she has applied for provincial programs that offer support, she says it's not enough to cover the bills. Common sense has gone out the window and politicians have forgotten about people. According to Provincial Health Services, every year approximately 500 patients from the Kootenai region travel to a BC Cancer Centre. Like Len Moody and his wife Judith, who spent a month in Kelowna last year for radiation therapy for his prostate cancer, at a cost of around $6,000. We might get back maybe a quarter. He says he feels forgotten about in the southeast corner of the province. The amount of times you turn the TV on and you hear the amount of money being spent for the medical system, I'm going to say west of Kelowna. It's unbelievable. There are currently six regional cancer centres in BC, and the province recently announced four additional centres in Burnaby, Surrey, Nanaimo and Kamloops. It's part of the province's new 10-year cancer plan, an investment of $440 million. And last September, BC announced $20 million in funding to help cancer patients travel for treatment. No action was taken for a long time. It was a priority for me, and we've made that change. But even local officials say it's not enough. Two cases where I've heard now where patients are going, I'm not going. I'm not going. I can't afford it. I'm not going. Um, I'm just going to let nature take its course. Um, and that's so sad to hear because that shouldn't ever happen. Dix says the province is investing $40 million into improving services at the East Kootenai Regional Hospital. He also pointed to the $156 million expansion of the FW Green Home in Cranbrook. But in the meantime, patients like Len and Sawyer will have to travel at a great personal cost to get the care they need. Corey Bullock, CBC News, Cranbrook. Hundreds of international students converged on downtown Vancouver today, protesting changes to permanent residency standards in B.C. The province's update to the nominee program won't take effect until next year, but as Saurabh Sandhu reports, students say it'll hamper their shot at becoming a permanent resident. Students unite! Students fight! A sharp reaction from a group of international students gathered on a wet Saturday morning to make their voices heard. The group is protesting the changes BC government announced earlier this week to its much sought-after provincial nominee program for permanent residency. 
I have declined offers from New Zealand and offers from Ireland because at that time, BC, BC's policy was stated as international master students on the BCPNP list for IPG stream. They could directly apply for provincial nomination at that time. As of next year, master students in the STEM fields are no longer automatically eligible for the PNP program and instead need a year of full-time work experience before registering. The province says the changes are aimed at providing greater clarity of high standards needed to get an invite through the program. The published guidelines of who would be eligible to apply and be successful in the program were not reflective of the reality of who actually was getting a spot through the program. Applicants will soon have to demonstrate a greater level of English language proficiency. BC government says it's also an attempt to rein in the recruiters who misrepresent BCPNP as an easy pathway to permanent residency. But for the hopeful students, they say the changes are too sudden and completely discount those who are already studying in the province. For myself speaking, from preparation to application all the way up to graduation, it takes three plus years and you can just not change it overnight. I think policy does not just pop up all of a sudden. There should be some process, but this, pro but this process should be released to everyone and we should know about the changes. The protesting students have started an online petition asking the BC government to offer some kind of transition period to students currently enrolled. The province says about 5% of post-graduation work permit holders in BC get invites for the PNP program's master graduate stream, with thousands more hoping to qualify and make BC their permanent home. Saurabh Sandhu, CBC News, Vancouver. Elsewhere in Vancouver, crowds gather to protest Hong Kong's new security law, which they say will further erode civil, civil liberties. We can prosecute anybody who say bad thing to the government, and that is we call at the red line. We don't know where the red line is because the uh, people who prosecute the people like uh, people in the court or, or the police, they can just arrest you without any reason because they think that you are violating the Article 23. That law was passed unanimously by Beijing lawmakers this week and officially came into effect today. Australia, Britain and the U.S. have all expressed criticism of the new law, suggesting it could damage Hong Kong's reputation as an international hub. The United Nations and European Union noted how swiftly the law was passed with limited public consultation. For its part, Hong Kong authorities condemned the global criticism as, quote, political maneuvers, fact-twisting, scaremongering and panic-spreading remarks. In the interior, a man has died at Sun Peak Ski Resort northeast of Kamloops. The resort says the members of their ski patrol found the injured man on Thursday. He later died. Sun Peak says it is cooperating with an RCMP investigation. There have been several other fatalities at BC ski resorts this season, including a 32-year-old woman who died at Whistler Blackcomb earlier this month. A high-profile Canadian gang leader who escaped to Puerto Rico and posed as a businessman is now back in custody in B.C. Connor DeMont, who was said to be a high-ranking member of the United Nations gang in B.C., he's accused in the 2009 killing of Kevin LeClaire, a rival gang member with the Red Scorpions. He was shot dead outside a Langley strip mall. DeMonte was considered one of Canada's most wanted fugitives before he was found and arrested in Puerto Rico in 2022. He's now been returned to this country to face trial. Well, cities, landmarks and homes around the world dimmed their lights tonight to mark Earth Hour. Here in Vancouver, Science World and BC Place both went dark for an hour at 8.30 p.m. In Australia, Sydney's famed Opera House and the Harbour Bridge were among the first landmarks to go dark. The very first Earth Hour started in 2007, easing electricity for an hour to symbolize the fight against climate change. It's now observed in more than 190 countries across the globe. Well, the Vancouver Auto Show has been taking over the convention center this week, and today women in the industry took over. They shared their businesses and experiences as women in a male-dominated sector.
Even yesterday, I had someone who I was introducing myself, trying to show them, you know, what I've done. They're in the industry, and the first, their first impression, the first thing they wanted to do was quiz me about my knowledge. Do you know who Mary Barra is? And I thought, you know what, I maybe if this is a fun thing for you, but perhaps it's not necessarily the most fun thing for me. Like I worked at General Motors, of course I know who the most powerful woman in the world is, but it makes me feel a little bit uh, uneasy. But I, you gotta just rise above that. According to the website Canadian Auto Dealer, 90% of women wouldn't step into a dealership without a man, even though women purchase more than half of all cars and influence the purchase of nearly 9 in 10 car buying decisions. Well, the community of Chase has won a $100,000 ice rink reno, courtesy of the Vancouver Canucks. The Game Changer Reno contest was launched a few months ago. Residents could nominate a rink in need of an upgrade. Then a panel of judges selected the winner based on the community spirit and passion for hockey. Turns out the Art Holding Memorial Arena, built in 1999, is now home to the Chase Heat and the Shoe Swap Skating Club, and they're all celebrating their big win. Take a look. We were the winners of the Game Changer Reno program. We're a small town. We're, we're used to doing more with less. $100,000 of infrastructure being put into our arena, which is an absolutely massive thing for a little town like us. The real heart of the, of the fans and, and, and the club is really in these small communities. It keeps the community together, does it not? I mean, it's amazing to see the turnout uh, today. It goes to show you how important it is, uh, not just hockey, but whatever other sport they have in the community. Still ahead, the state funeral for Canada's 18th Prime Minister, Brian Mulroney, was held today in Montreal. We'll have all of that coming up for you next. Stay with us.
Welcome back. Let's take you to Ottawa now. Former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney was honoured at a state funeral in Montreal today. He was remembered by family as a loving parent and by colleagues as one of the greats in Canadian politics. The CBC Sarah Levitt was at today's service. With bells tolling and snow falling, Brian Mulroney's family watched on as the final procession for the former Prime Minister took place. From Montreal's St. Patrick's Basilica, with deep ties to the Irish Mulroney family, to Notre Dame Basilica in the heart of Old Montreal. Those inside a who's who of Canadian history, commemorating the life of the country's 18th Prime Minister. At this very moment, we live in a world that he helped shape. We live in the country that he helped build. And because of Brian Mulroney, we live in one of the greatest countries in the world, Canada. Born in Bay Como, Quebec in 1939, Mulroney would go on to become a labour lawyer, a businessman and a politician who would lead Canada for nine years. It was a tumultuous time with triumphs and controversies forming the lasting legacy on display at his funeral. He was motivated by leadership, by getting the big things right. And even when times got tough, Brian always stayed generous, charming and very funny. Mulroney's wit and comedic touch appreciated by even those who bore the brunt of the joke. And he goes, young man, remember 1993? That was a great victory for the Montreal Canadiens, right? And I said, sir, I was on the other team. <laughs> Above all, though, Mulroney was a family man. His wife, four children and 16 grandchildren, all present to commemorate him. When asked to comment on the significance of his election on the night of his victory, my father's first response was not what the journalists expected. It's Caroline Mulroney's ninth birthday, he exclaimed on national television. At a moment of great achievement, he showed the country what his family meant to him. When Irish eyes are smiling, a favorite of Mulroney's sung by one of his granddaughters. The song he too once sang alongside U.S. President Ronald Reagan. At his funeral, Mulroney couldn't leave without having the last word, or rather, song. We'll meet again, don't know where, don't know when. A fitting way to say goodbye. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. In international news, Russia is reeling from its deadliest mass attack in nearly two decades. Gunmen stormed a crowded concert hall yesterday. The number of dead now stands at 133. The CBC's Evil Musa has the latest. Where there was death and destruction, now in Moscow there is grief. Scores are dead after gunmen stormed this concert hall Friday night. Video posted online showed them shooting civilians at point-blank range. And in their wake was left a smoldering ruin. They were just walking and gunning down everyone methodically in silence, says this witness. ISIS has claimed responsibility. And this expert explains why the group may consider Russia a target. Russia's military intervention in 2015 in Syria was decisive. It allowed to defeat the various opposition groups, including uh, the Islamic State. In an address to the nation, Russia's president called it a bloody and barbaric terrorist act. Vladimir Putin says 11 people have been arrested, including the four alleged gunmen directly involved in the attack. The Russian leader also claims they were captured while trying to flee to Ukraine. Kiev has accused Putin of falsely linking Ukraine to boost support for Russia's war. I don't think this is really a Ukrainian operation. That's not how Ukrainian uh, intelligence services operate. Ukraine's presidential advisor denies his country's involvement. In Russia, Putin has called for a nationwide day of mourning on Sunday and says the perpetrators of the attack will be justly and inevitably punished. Idil Musa, CBC News, Toronto. 
Here's a live shot of Canby Street in BC Place. Well, the rain has cleared and it'll make way for a sunny Sunday, but that dry weather won't last long, at least not for the coast. I'll have your long orange forecast next. And time for the five-day forecast and what a stark contrast this weekend was to last. Certainly nowhere near the sunny, warm temperatures we saw. Uh, for the forecast for tonight, though, we will see clear conditions. Uh, Safe for Cranbrook, uh, possibly in the East Kootenays there and on the island as well. Some precipitation, otherwise mainly clear. Uh, temperatures uh, below zero for the most part through the interior and the north as well. And we're pretty much right on par as far as our temperatures go right across BC. Here's a precipitation forecast. We will have a, a beautiful Sunday right across across most of BC, lots of sunshine. It'll be nice to see that blue sky again, at least here on the south coast. We were socked in all day with that rain and drizzle. Uh, you can see though the next few days and early into next week, we'll see those spotty showers continue off and on. And uh, that'll give us kind of a chance of showers, chance of flurries, of course, in those higher elevations, uh, depending on where you are, that precipitation will kind of go off and on. But here's for tomorrow, it'll be beautiful. Uh, the only place uh, is the Cranbrook, 60% chance of flurries there. Plus one is the high, the average high is plus 11. So certainly below average for the Kootenays right now. That is your late news for this Saturday, March 23rd. For news anytime, anywhere, download the free CBC News app. You can always find us online at cbc.ca slash bc. Thanks for watching. Have a good night.